So it's two o'clock. Uh, good afternoon and welcome everyone to this, this new lecture from the Bern uh, lecture series on, on health sciences. We have tonight a special speaker, uh, she's uh, talking to us from Hong Kong. So we are very, looking, very much looking forward to hear everything uh, that is going to be presented today in the seminar. And I give the word to Thomas Abel, Professor Abel, if you don't mind, please, uh, please introduce our speaker at the series. Thank you, Oscar. Uh, a hearty welcome also from my side um, to this day seminar and uh, my name is Thomas Abel and uh, some of you may recall uh, I'm part of that group, the ISPM working group that uh, aims to strengthen the uh, practice impact of ISPM research and uh, in particular also our impact on public health policies. So uh, we organized the mini series of five talks and today is uh, talk number four. And uh, it's a special talk because uh, Professor Vivian Lin will, uh, is offering what I would call an analytic approach uh, to the complexities that we are facing when scientific research meets the reality of health policies. And um, Vivian uh, is, uh, has a great academic career, um, a history in the US, in Australia, and most recently in Hong Kong. Uh, her fields of expertise, I had to write down because the, the range is so broad. I mean, I'm, I'm really impressed by this. This is about health insurance coverage on a global scale, uh, the SDGs, gender-based violence, and many more. But today we have invited Vivian for her insights into the understanding and improving uh, the, the, the collaboration between research and policy. So we are very much looking forward to this. Just a short comment, please use the chat option to uh, ask questions. Uh, we will try to address them afterwards. Usually we've managed quite well, we will address them all. But also, of course, at the end of Vivian's talk, uh, please switch on your camera, your microphones and discuss with Vivian or with others, we will uh, ac accommodate this type of exchange as well. So without any further ado, it's my great, great pleasure to ask you, Vivian, to start and uh, take us on your tour. Please, Vivian. Thank you so much, Thomas. And thank you to Bern, University of Bern, ISPM, for the opportunity to meet everyone online, it would be lovely to be able to meet face to face sometime in the future, perhaps. Um, in some ways, I feel like I'm about to tell you the story of my life. These are some hard earned lessons um, interspersed with, you know, opportunities to uh, practice and to reflect. Um, over 30 some years of working in both academia as well as in the policy world. So let me try to go to my slides and take you through um, how my journey has gone. What I want to do, uh, is to actually be able to move my screen, <laughs> um, but it seems to be stuck. Okay, let's see how it goes. So I wanna give a quick overview of the historical evolution of this discourse around evidence and policy. I'm not sure how much people know, so I wanna just go through it very quickly uh, rather than dwell too much on it. I wanna focus more about some of my practical learnings and then to think about what is to be done. Uh, basically, my key message will be that the technical rigor in health policy has to be accompanied by political rigor on the part of the health researchers. And that 
because of the system complexity and the changing context that really characterize the policy world, co-creation and co-production processes is what is required. Now, some of you may be familiar, I don't need to go over the rise of evidence-based medicine, the Cochrane collaboration, and from there we had terms like evidence-based health policy, evidence-based health promotion, evidence-based health management, evidence-based physiotherapy, Chinese medicine, and so on and so forth, which then evolved into evidence-based decision-making. And interestingly enough, now people have moved away from that evidence-based frame to evidence-informed. And I think that reflects perhaps the collective learning in the field. In Australia, where I spent many years working, there was a very influential report uh, by Jonathan Lomas uh, from Canada, which looked at this problem of how do you then take your evidence base into policy and practice. And he titled the report, The Sound of One Hand Clapping. And it's very evocative, of course. And what it's given rise to is a lot of work around this two world analysis that we have the world of researchers and we have the world of policymakers. But from there, the language is evolved to research transfer or translation. And then people said, no, it's not just research, it's knowledge because it's more than that. And then people said, no, it isn't just transfer. It's actually about um, translation into context. So it's really knowledge management and indeed knowledge exchange because it has to go both ways. So now we're into knowledge co-production and of course implementation science is the latest hot thing. Um, so very briefly, the two worlds kind of thesis talked about how research and policy were different in terms of research trying to clarify when there's information uncertainty, but policy is often when there's, it's about making a moral judgment when there's value uncertainty. Um, there's very different time frame. Uh, research controls for bias, searches for the truth, deconstructs. Policy is constructive and contextual. And perhaps the best characterization um, to go to the legal uh, metaphor is that in research, we're looking for beyond reasonable doubt. But in policy, a decision gets made on the balance of probability. So very different kinds of tests. And so this theory describes why the, how the incentives are very different in say the university setting, the time frame. So the rhythm of work is very different and the accountability is very different. However, for the policymakers, it's the election cycle, it's the votes. It's a very different kind of a constituency. So um, the rhythm of work uh, is different. And indeed, the whole analytical and decision-making process is different. In the research world, you identify the problem, you think about the options, you intervene, you evaluate. And that, that's your evidence. In the policy, you may identify the same problem, but you might think first about what is the context for this. You might think about the options, but you want to then think about the reactions you could get and then exercise your judgment. And most of the time you never evaluate because you've got the next crisis you're going to worry about. So in the textbooks, there's a teaching that the policy cycle is a rational technical process. It is this, you identify the problem, you analyze it, you might consult, you decide, you implement, you evaluate. So it's a rational technical approach. And this gives rise to what is often the conventional wisdom in this two world framing, which is that the research teachers create the knowledge, more researchers adopt it, they disseminate, and then the knowledge is adopted by the policymaker. 
And in many ways, when we think about models of research transfer, this becomes the engineering model. Typically, you do the research, you create the product, you disseminate, um, and there you have it. But the, those who are writing in this two world mode said, oh, you know, the world is more complex than that because there are two different worlds. So you have a ch choice of whether you ha hire somebody in your research institute whose job it is to communicate and push it out. And they often are communication experts. And others who work in the policy world said, well, that doesn't always work because it may just go into the ether. So you need to have somebody in the bureaucracy who pulls it in and who can scan the horizon. And then others said, no, because, you know, the environment and the context are still different and people don't understand the culture of academia or bureaucracy. So what you need is a knowledge broker who might spend half time in each place. And that's how you do it. And that has certainly been uh, implemented and tested and evaluated. Um, but there's another analysis, which is none of these are actually sufficient because you actually have to understand how policies get made. And so um, in, in one frame, the policy come together when the different kind of rationalities can coincide. So there's a technical rationality, which is how the researchers think about it, but rationality from a political viewpoint may be quite different. And in the community, the cultural expectations may also be quite different. So these need to come together. Oops, sorry, I just... Um, Are you seeing the full window? Yes, we are seeing. So it's you might want to switch to presentation mode down there. Okay. okay so then there's another interesting model um, that's called triangle that moves the mountain. And this comes from the, the ties in particular, where they say you may have knowledge You've got to involve the politicians, but unless you can mobilize society, it's not going to work. So that's how policy change happens. But policy change in the kingdom model suggests that the policymakers face many different problems and there are many people who have solutions. It's only when the policy solutions, the policy problems and the political wills intersect that decisions will be made. But others have said, you know, there's a big gap between Washington DC and Oakland. And whatever decisions get made in Washington DC, by the time it travels out to the West Coast, the world looks very different. So the implementers and the street bureaucrats are often exercising uh, free will in the way that they interpret and implement. So another way of thinking about it is to say you actually need to do some implementation analysis while you're developing the policy so that you can prevent implementation failure. So these are some of the different kinds of analysis, which is not to say that a rational technical view isn't right. It's just that it's better applied when there's a very discrete program and when the boundaries are quite clear. Uh, but when you get to the policy side, the problems are complex, the decision environment is complex, there may be multiple alternatives and very broad uh, decision criteria, which makes it challenging. Um, so in the context of all that, um, I want to share uh, some of my experiences. Now, when I first started working as a health planner in Western Sydney, it was as if 
you know, all the things I was taught came true. Um, as a planner, I went in there and I said, what are the health problems? And do we have enough resources? And are the resources in the right place? So we did what we called an epidemiological profile. This was before the term social determinants of health became um, commonly used. And what we found was there was this absolute social gradient for every single health issues. And indeed with all the social indicators. And then we did this long-term forecasting and modeling exercise on hospital planning. Um, and lo and behold, what we found was that the average length of stay was gonna go down. So the absolute number of beds were fine, but they were just located in the wrong place. And so we went around firstly, taking the epidemiological profile to different government departments and talking to them about the community. We went to hospital boards and they all said, oh, people only talked to us about budgets before. We never knew what the health issues were in our community. So they were very engaged. Local governments were interested. They used all our information for lobbying. And with our hospital planning, we proposed all future investments would go into particular locations to build up the health system. So that it, instead of every election um, driving the investment into electorates, it was actually put on a rational footing. So you could imagine as a young health planner, I thought, you know, this, the world is wonderful. Everything I learned, I could do. It's only on reflection and many hard experiences later that I realized what happened was I actually understood the policy problem that people were interested in. I didn't think of it at, at the time, but there were real constraints on the one hand on allocation of financial resources and capital resources in particular. On the other hand, a lot of competition for that resource and all of which was quite poorly used in a very rapidly expanding area of about 1.3 million people. Um, so I tapped into the right problem with the right data. I also managed to excite the imagination of stakeholders that they learned more and they could find the solution. So it was kind of accidental because the next thing I found myself doing were much more difficult in terms of trying to kind of think about what's the evidence. So I was involved in the registration of Chinese medicine in Victoria, which was the first jurisdiction outside of greater China to comprehensively regulate. And as you can imagine, you know, all the doctors and public health people said, there's no evidence for Chinese medicine. And there's a lot of reasons why clinical evidence is difficult. Um, but I found myself in the minister's office with the head of a um, couple of, uh, the head of the College of Physicians and the head of the clinical pharmacology area and they were telling the minister, you know, you shouldn't do this because there's no evidence and you'll be seen as backing something with no evidence. And the minister said, the evidence I have is the profession is unable to regulate itself. And that's part of the research that was done. The other bit of evidence I have is that this is actually risky that people without good interaction, understanding the interaction between Chinese and medicine, Western medicine, people die. <clears throat> but the other med, uh, evidence I have is the users are actually tertiary educated women in the main who live in 
all kinds of electorates. And so it taught me that this, this fixation with clinical efficacy is not necessarily the basis for policy making. I think I involved in developing the first major health promotion project in China funded by the World Bank. And, and I'm thinking about evidence-based health promotion and what it is that Chinese should do. Then I got really stuck about, do I go to the English language literature, which is mostly US, UK, and parts of the Europe? Is that the right evidence in the Chinese cultural context? Or do I try to go to Japan and Korea for something that was culturally more appropriate? Yet the Chinese institutions for delivering health promotion was still very much in that Soviet model. So do I need to look at Central and Eastern Europe and Russia? for the evidence. So I started to challenge myself much more. At the same time, one of the people uh, I was working with was analyzing um, where health, the different health insurance models that China might adopt as China was examining where to go with health financing. And the Chinese spent many, many years looking at the NHS in the UK, looking at the American health insurance system, looking at the mixed model of Canada and Australia. And for their pilots, they ended up with the Singaporean model, which at that point was very new, the medical savings accounts, and never tried anywhere else in the world. And so the question is, Given that they had studied all this evidence, why did they go to something which really had so little evidence behind it? So I became much more, I suppose, reflective about just what is it that we actually need to do? And so then I was very luckily involved with the Cooperative Research Centre for Aboriginal Health. Now in Australia, a Cooperative Research Centre is a seven year funding partnership between government, service providers, uh, communities, Aboriginal communities and uh, universities. And we were, because it was Aboriginal health and therefore not mainstream, it was actually okay to innovate. And we thought if you had seven years and your job was to actually solve some real practical problems, what do you do? Do you do a standard literature review when there's so many areas that really haven't been researched? Or do you go to the community and look at what they see as their priorities and design your work around that? In the end, we devised an end user driven research where it was an iterative process between the communities identifying the problems, then the research saying, we know the answers to that because the research has been done or we don't know that and we need to design a research project. The researchers had difficulty oftentimes figuring out how to design around a practical problem. So it was a learning process on both sides. So as an example, we had a major medical research institution that said, we've been doing uh, intervention on um, rheumatic heart disease um, and scabies in Aboriginal communities. And we were successful in one community, but we tried the same intervention in seven others. It didn't work. So we think this is, has to do now with perhaps resistance to drugs um, and we need to hire an epidemiologist and a lab person in order to actually analyze this problem of resistance. And the community people said, um, why were you not able to sustain it? Have you actually worked on 
the problems of sustainability, and it never occurred to the researchers that that might be something they needed to do. And then the community people said, and if you already knew the answer to what could work, why not we just go do it, transfer that knowledge? So the medical research institution was funded firstly to uh, analyze the problem of sustainability, secondly, to develop a research translation plan. A year later, they came back to the community and said, you know, we know how to do the lab work and the epidemiology, but we actually don't know how to do the research translation. Um, and uh, sustainability is actually kind of not a field we've thought about. So those, this was a very humbling experience for them. And then we were concerned about heart disease. So we went through another process where multiple researchers and community people got together to talk about um, this problem with heart disease, um, premature mortality. And so the different researchers went away and designed many different projects that came back to the board. There was a project around health promotion. There was a project around um, de detection, screening. It was, when you think about all, the whole continuum for heart disease, a project was designed. But what also became obvious in the proposals was the Aboriginal men had the worst problem, whether you were trying to do a lifestyle promotion or whether you were trying to actually get them to go to the hospital earlier. And so the community said, I think we've got a problem with the men. And so this heart disease project actually became a men's health project and went beyond the heart disease and in, it indeed addressed many of the health issues. So these are some of the examples of the kind of shifts that I was involved with. But of course, not everything worked. And so I learned about the importance of context. After the success of the Chinese medicine registration research and policy process, I was asked to take on a similar study on regulation of naturopathy and Western, her Western herbal medicine. The data was in fact quite similar. And when you look at the ministers, uh, the evidence that the minister paid attention to, it was all there. However, the report went absolutely nowhere. And it was because there just wasn't quite the political lobby in the same way as Chinese medicine. And there wasn't the cohesiveness of views. So without that kind of political push, the evidence didn't matter. I was also involved with a project looking at indicators for gender equity and health. And this is something that has been going on a long time in the women's health field in particular, where people say, we've got to disaggregate data and everything should be reporting both men and women. And I get a little bit impatient with people saying what should be done. And I thought, well, do it. So we decided to analyze the commonly used indicators for health across global agencies, as well as um, the ones that are about to be adopted, we identified 1,092 indicators um, that uh, we could find that might give us some sense of health status and what's broken down into male and female and what's reported. It turned out that the vast majority um, was about women. In fact, there were only four about men. Over 90% of the indicators for women were related to sexual and reproductive health, which says something about our view of women. And the ones about men were either about prostate or violence, which also says something about our views of men. 
So then we argue that, in fact, no one in their right mind is going to look at that many indicators. We got to get this down to a really small group. And we want to focus on the concept of leading health indicators. In other words, indicators which, if you look at it now, might give you some sense of the trajectory into the future, as opposed to indicators that just told you about the past. So we identify things like tobacco and poverty that were really suggestive of poor health outcomes. And so there was a group of people in the World Health Organization working on this, trying to move it forward. What they hadn't anticipated was bureaucratic politics. And there was another group that actually had a different set of interests. We're pushing for a very different agenda. And this work simply died. So, so I learned much more about the complexity of organizations and trying to move things through. But then I got to the WHO as the director of health systems and was charged with looking at universal health coverage in 36 countries and areas across the Western Pacific. And my God, life got really complicated. Um, because while we could look at a certain typology as I have outlined here for countries, they were so different. And the transitional economies included China and the Mekong countries. They really needed a wholesale redesign of the institutional framework for the health system. But when we got to the small Pacific islands, it was about trying to shift a health system that had previously really focused on immunization and maternal and child health to something that can cope with hundreds of unnecessary amputations because of diabetes as an example of the high burden of non-communicable diseases. And you go to a place like Philippines or Papua New Guinea, you're looking at such highly de decentralized countries. Philippines has 1500 local governments, each responsible for a health system, except many were not big enough to have a full health system. Yet there was no connection between the different parts of the system. And, and this goes across 7,000 islands. In Papua New Guinea, you're talking about 700 different languages with very poor transportation. So how do you actually start to actually link and ensure equity? And of course, we also have countries like Japan, Korea, Australia, and New Zealand, which was completely focused on aging, on health inequalities, on cost containment, trying to shift rigid work practices using disruptive technologies. So, so what do you do? Because in every single place, didn't matter whether it was, you know, 1 billion in China or 200,000 in Samoa, you've got multiple stakeholders who have their views. And governments have to actually figure out how to manage the politics. And if they had a vision to communicate it, to operationalize it, to explain the rationale for their policy choices, which really raise the question of what is the evidence base and how do you communicate that um, within context? So my new understanding coming through all this is we can really only think about um, universal health coverage, despite the fact that it's a universal problem for all countries from a complexity viewpoint. Because a health system, it's a social and political intervention. It's a social construction. It has multiple interconnected elements which are adaptive, which are resilient. The Chinese often say from above come policy, from below come counter strategy. And that is this continuous negotiation uh, dialectic and the dynamic uh, that goes on within a system. And health systems are path dependent. 
uh, because of history, because of culture. And once you lock into certain patterns of ownership and financing, it's very, very difficult. So how do you actually make change happen and what sort of policy, uh, what sort of evidence would you actually incorporate into policy? So clearly the health system and universal health coverage is just one of a myriad of health system problems, albeit perhaps the big umbrella issue. They're really what uh, Weber and Rittle have characterized in public policies as wicked problems. There's no shared understanding. There's no definitive formulation. There's complex interdependencies. Each piece is related to something else. The cause and effect is not clear. The input might produce an output, but that output is an input to something else. Um, and in many cases, there's no immediate solution. And the effectiveness of the different policy tools in use is often not clear. And when you do decide to intervene, you might give rise to new problems that will be solved. And whether it's effective or not kind of depends on the stakeholders. Um, so again, it raises this question of what is the role of evidence in solving wicked public policy problems because of these complexity of actors and activities. So I've evolved towards the design thinking and I know it's kind of faddish and a lot of people are working on this, but it really is about kind of thinking that is solution focused. And it's a process and it's a discourse that is about exchange, it's about debate, it's an iterative, iterative process to try and resolve different ideas. It's about moving from cognitive to practical and back to cognitive. It's about understanding the context, the ideas for, for solutions, testing them, synthesizing the different types of evidence and testing out different types of solutions. Um, so it's really centered around the user. Now, design thinking people talk about uh, five different steps. Um, and in that sense, you almost say, oh, gee, that's a little linear. Um, and I'm sure it's really quite iterative, but you start by understanding the problem. Um, and there are many different kinds of problems but what's really important is understanding the wants and the needs of the users and the people who will be impacted. And you explore with them the ideas and the mindsets about what they're ready to accept. What do they understand? And you have to then test ideas, ideally pilot, test the feasibility. You need rigorous research but you also need to provide action learning opportunities along the way. So perhaps a different kind of a wisdom that then emerges is that you actually get, try to get the policy practitioners to articulate their knowledge and their questions. And the researchers are there to add value, to produce new knowledge, and together, it's about transforming the, the knowledge. Now, but as a researcher, you might wanna know, how do I actually really influence this bloody thing? Um, uh, rather because we have to actually push the policy makers to actually be more rigorous. So the first thing I think is you gotta be able to map the terrain. What are the ideas that are there? Who are the kind of networks? Understanding the structure and the power is quite important part of the terrain. You also need to think about the kind of evidence you need to help you frame because a lot of policy making is around community values, perceptions, interest group behavior, as well as the capacity of actors 
um, different organizations to make changes um, and the incentives that drive them. So very, very important to understand the cultures. And then I think you get to the technical issues and you have to have a whole range of different evidence, the epidemiological, the operational, the conditional effectiveness. To me, this is really important. It's about under what conditions for whom um, things will work and then the feasibility and acceptability. Uh, so there's still a very substantial interdisciplinary type of research agenda that's necessary. Um, but in the longer term, as they say, don't just give them fish, teach them how to do fishing. And so the question is having clarity about how does the evidence feed in and knowing where you're actually fitting into the system and then working with the policymakers to try and develop mechanisms which structure opportunities for ongoing engagement and learning, making sure that infrastructures are in place. So this is where the two world analysis is very helpful in terms of thinking about the mechanisms and there's a need to develop the capacity for better communication, for better understanding of research on both sides. So in conclusion, policies are social and political interventions and always involves both politics and a technical argument. And policy decisions reflect that choice um, between action, um, which is action and structure, which is the context and the political economy. Policy making is a continuous process of negotiation that incorporates patterns of everyday values and practices. So never far away from history and culture and evidence have meanings that are carried in the context and arguments. They don't speak for themselves and they can be interpreted very differently. So if we're interested, as I remain so, in a theoretically informed policy as well as evidence informed policy, then the question becomes, how do I manage that interplay between the technical and the political? And what kind of iterative process I need to have with the stakeholders? So go to the standard questions for the series. If the goals is to improve technical rigor in health policy, to ensure that health policies are addressing population health concerns and not just another politician's concerns, and to build the partnership between researchers and policy actors, then I think the starting point is with the real world concerns, having a variety of evidence to address all the stakeholders' questions and to put into a process to ensure that the ownership is there of both the problem and the solution. What are the kind of risks? Well, I think there's so much of public health research focuses on the nature of the problem rather than the potential policy solution. And oftentimes we tend to go to the abstract design the perfect model, and we're not thinking about the implementation risks and unanticipated consequences. And we forget that context and politics change frequently and unpredictably. So what might be some risk mitigation measures? Well, I think by involving the end users from the beginning to the end in research, help us understand how the context and the climate might be changing and what is uh, the capacity to implement. I think if we were working from multidisciplinary teams, methods, theoretical frameworks, then we probably appreciate the range of stakeholders better. And at the end of the day, we need to be agile. Um, as context, stakeholders change, 
we've got to be able to, on the one hand, keep our eye on what's important. On the other hand, be very adaptive because perfect is the enemy of the good enough. So let me finish there. I think we still have a little bit of time for some discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Vivian. Um, I'm sure there will be uh, comments and maybe some challenges in the discussion. Um, so we had um, uh, two chat comments and uh, I wonder if Timothy could actually share his uh, or her uh, comment and uh, yes, please, Timothy, why don't you add this to the discussion? Um, thank you very much. Uh, that was a nice, very good presentation, uh, Miss Lynn. Um, I'm Tim and I, I also work in public health and development. Um, primarily in uh, local health systems in the Philippines. So you mentioned how highly fragmented it is and uh, how each local chief executive has to manage his or her own uh, local health system. Um, uh, my comment is by uh, responding to the challenges by uh, successive approximation because um, I actually resonate a lot with what you have presented earlier um, in terms of complexity and at the same time, the uh, uh, need for adaptive approach um, in, in, real, in reality on the ground because some, most of the policies are really good on paper, but when they hit the ground, they, 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 they really do not connect. And... Um, the reason why I put the comment there is because um, uh, I really like the idea of putting together systems thinking and uh, design thinking um, because it um, plugs the gaps or the holes in each other. Um, the, 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 the challenges in design thinking is maybe it is what, just one designer or maybe a team of designers trying to design interventions and it doesn't automatically mean that the community is involved in the design. So that's where systems thinking comes in. Because when you do your empathize, your, your inspiration, your uh, defining the problem from whose perspective, if you include the community already right from the start, then uh, what we call in systems thinking, you bring the system into the room. You bring the system into the room so that dialogue, meaningful conversations, shared meaning, shared values can happen. And then that actually drives the framing of the problem and also the framing of the prototypes in, uh, in, the, in the design thinking. And what happens is because um, you have dynamic complexity, you have uh, uh, social complexity, and then you have generative complexity. Some of these are wicked problems that have we haven't found solutions for ages. And actually, the, what we need to tap into is the wisdom of the community. Um, the, 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 the best solutions for these wicked problems are actually found in the communities that are immersed in the problem. And the researchers, the policymakers must find a middle ground through dialogue with the community, with the community knowledge, community wisdom. And once you get that, you don't actually have a perfect solution, but you iterate along the way. You iterate because you, you put it back to the community, the community gives feedback and uh, you change a little bit and then you put it back to the community. That becomes responsiveness. It becomes a responsiveness of programs which eventually will achieve or address your inequities, your health inequities and your social determinants, et cetera, especially if you do it multi-sectoral. Um, Thank yeah, you. I, th I think that's it, yeah. Uh, yeah, it would be great for Vivian to have a chance to respond to this. Uh, what I hear, one of the key uh, issues here is participation. And uh, do we leave it to the designers, maybe one or two, Timothy mentioned, uh, so Vivian, what, how, how do you see the role of the, uh, the citizens, citizenship in, in finding solutions to wicked problems 
or are they actually increasing the wickedness of the problem? Um, you know, I, I love Tim's framing of resolving challenges through successive approximation. I think that brings it together really, really nicely. And I, I think that um, without the participation, you create problems. With participation, you may create other problems, but you're much more likely to find wisdom and find solutions. Uh, I agree with, with Tim absolutely on that. Um, now, each place is quite complex. And, you know, the thing I actually really love about what's going on in COVID, and I know we shouldn't really say anything good about COVID, but COVID is presenting from an, an intellectual and academic viewpoint, so many interesting questions. So I look at the way um, there's a very top-down approach north of the border from Hong Kong in mainland China. And they think that Hong Kong is not able to get on top of it and they should just adopt these mainland approaches. And you think, well, it's Chinese culture, you know, Chinese culture is pretty, you know, top-down. And <laughs> when it happens in Hong Kong, when they go to the communities, do a lockdown, what they actually missed is that on the mainland, they've got an associational, a territorial type of governance where everything is very tightly connected, knitted in terms of a location and its governance. In Hong Kong, it's more of an associational and so when they go to a place and try and lock down, people are in different places and transmission is a completely different pattern and people don't, you know, behave um, the way because people's relationships to government are different. So even in terms of the question of who would you involve and where is the community's participation, you still have to think about that in the context of specifics. So you could have a universal principle, but the application is absolutely context specific. Thanks. Uh, I wonder we could, of course, uh, now have those uh, uh, go back to the chats or some spontaneous reaction. Uh, I do have a chat uh, that actually David mm. offered and uh, David Hunter is with us. So, and that relates to the value base that you uh, mentioned, Vivian. And uh, perhaps David, you can ask your question directly. Okay, thank you, Thomas. And thank you, Vivian, for a very interesting talk. I agreed with all you said, um, it all struck home uh, immediately. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm a professor of health policy and management at Newcastle University in the United Kingdom. Um, my question, uh, Vivian, was really for, for academics in the research world, often the funding and the organization of research is a barrier to thinking about the kinds of research that you were suggesting we needed, uh, particularly um, research that's uh, focusing on solutions rather than problems and on uh, research that's good enough rather than perfect and which engages policymakers and attempts to understand complex settings. And it seems to me that in many countries, the way we think about research still and fund it and organize it is a barrier to opening the process up to the kinds of ad adaptiveness that you were talking about. Do you have a comment on that? Look, I absolutely agree with you. I think, you know, this is um, perhaps, the, you know, people who are working on multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary approaches are still struggling against. Mm -hmm you know, a way that science has been thought about for a couple hundred years. Um, and the way research assessments run um, and research grant review run also drives towards both very narrowly and tightly defined questions mm -hmm. as well as very conventional and safe methodologies. And the consequence is that a lot of policymakers say, I don't know how that's relevant. Mm. That's a minutiae. 
so I really think so for me the the collaborative research centered type of approach starts to move closer a long-term partnership with an explicit goal of actually trying to solve some real problems thank you great yeah thank you um and uh Master, Master Zwanen offered a question that I also thought about is uh, that's uh, around this, uh, the function or the role of a broker. Master, do you want to share that question with us? Okay, thank you, Thomas. Hello, everybody. So I, I wrote it in the chat because actually I, I never heard of that concept before of knowledge brokers. And you mentioned very early in your talk that this was tested and evaluated, and that also got me interested in how, first, how do you test that? How do you evaluate it? And furthermore, do you have one concrete example to mention or then to later on give a, a reference for it? So the, the Canadians are the ones who've been at this much longer. And I think you've got John Davis also perhaps doing your next seminar. So this would be also be a good thing to talk with, with him about. But essentially what the, the, they've done in Canada is that they've had people with these research brokerage roles who either sit in a government bureaucracy like a health department or they sit in a research institution. And then they've compared them in terms of the degree of research uptake into policy. So trying to see which is more successful. So you've had people who are shared, you've had people who sit in one, you have people who sit in the other. And essentially what it shows is that actually having people uh, in the bureaucracy is the most important because in order to be a research broker, you already have to know something about research. And that means chances are you've already been in the research environment and have connections, have some appreciation of what's involved, know how to assess that. But it's understanding the policy world and the political culture that is really, really challenging. And it's a world that tends to be, you know, a little bit opaque. It's a little bit concerned about confidentiality. Um, and so you have to really have some very good navigational skills within the organization. Uh, so that's if essentially kind of, um, yeah, what okay. that. What that where is now the research, the, the, the knowledge broker actually working, the good one? The good, the, the good ones tend to be in the bureaucracy, but often with a joint appointment in the research uh -huh. institute but they have to be seen as neutral and not favoring a particular institution. Okay, that, to, just to, to be honest, such a thing doesn't exist in Switzerland. Okay. <laughs> and I was just wondering how many years it would take, uh, many years of training uh, that this person has all these skills and uh, that advanced knowledge and of, but maybe it's more like uh, years of experience. Um, and, uh, but as Marcel said, we don't have that, certainly not. And uh, I wonder if we could get institutions uh, to support this idea. Uh, perhaps we can work towards this, Marcel. Uh, let's, let's try, let's try. I think it's worth it. We, we could really try. I think the comment I would make is you don't actually want someone who's a specialist in an area because then they would tend to only look at things through their own special interest lens. What's important is probably a set of uh, skills like uh, emotional intelligence, so you, you know, empathy, <laughs> being insightful. Never heard of. Not sure what that is. <laughs> Communication. <laughs> yeah, but still, somehow I feel I would like to see that person at least have a public health background, you know, oh, have, yeah. have, have a master in public health to understand the interdisciplinarity that's needed, the different paradigms and all this. 
So, so it's not that I want a clinical psychology or, you know, somebody from a social worker. I really want a public health expert, uh, a broad one, but with, then with all the skills that you are uh, now pre shortly mentioned. Yeah, uh, I think the breadth is important. Yeah, yeah. Um, other immediate, uh, other questions uh, from the floor, although it's just a screen, unfortunately, but from the group. If there is none, I have one actually that links the, one of your first slides actually to the discussion we have now. That is, uh, on one of your slides, you, you, you phrased it as what you expect is political rigor from the side of the researcher. Rigor, I understand. Scientific rigor, of course, that's what we expect. But political rigor on the side of the researcher this needs a little explanation, a short explanation for me. Short. I, I think, you know, when we think about the scientists, we break down everything into small components. We understand relationships. We have to really think very closely about whatever it is, the issue. And I'm, what I'm suggesting is that researchers need to figure out how to do that with politics and policy. So quite often, you know, as a health policy person, what drives me wild when I get asked to review papers in a policy journal written by many public health people is that they go through and they present all their epidemiological or whatever other analysis. And then they have one paragraph that says, and from a policy viewpoint, this is what needs to be done. Um, <laughs> that okay. is not a policy paper, right? And so it's really understanding the policy system, understanding how the formal system and politics intersect, knowing, you know, so, so political theory matters. Um, but and I don't mean political philosophy, but understanding policy systems, understanding politics, um, in a much more refined way will help researchers get further if they're trying to actually influence policy change. Yeah. The Germans had the Goethe, who was a genius in everything he did. I mean, the highest standard in the natural science, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in lyrics even. I mean, aren't you asking too much? I mean, how I, I understand when you get nervous about uh, these small paragraphs. I, I do the same, you know. Uh, this suggests, you know, there's all this empirical evidence and then they suggest this clearly shows that this type of intervention needs to be done. I mean, they have done nothing on the intervention. Of course not. I understand that. But now you are asking for... I mean, the perfect experts on all the different perspectives in public health. It, it's impossible. You don't have it in one person. It's impossible to have it in one person. It's all about a team. And it's about recognizing what knowledge and skills you need that you don't have. And then finding those people who can actually help you. And you learn in the process, just as they learn from you. So instead of this paragraph saying, this is what needs to be done in practice, it should say, these are the, the open issues we have left. These are the, uh, the nexus points, potential nexus points for other researchers to add until we, and then finally we may get to an intervention uh, a design or something like this. Okay, on this we can agree. <laughs> okay, any other uh, also critical questions? Here's one from Annika Fraza. Annika, would you like to uh, share your point with us? Hi, thank you. Yes, um, thank you for the very interesting talk. I think I was just typing while you discussed the same issue. Does every um, 
every one of us has to turn into this multiple angle genius or do we have to consider what you also suggested in the talk about multidisciplinarity and then really have people with a specialty like political science or policy analysis more systematically involved in public research and have them look at the same issues like health equity from a different angle, how to put that into a political system, yes. You know, you know, I think, I don't know about Switzerland, but one of the things that I've seen in some countries is that the public health schools do not really spend time on policy. Um, you know, and, and in fact, I have a colleague who is a vaccinologist um, who didn't believe his school of public health needed to actually teach people policy because they say, if you go through our school, you will be a policy person. Now, I don't think that's the case. Even from, I mean, even if we look at the, the COVID vaccine issues, there are so many complex policy questions around it that you really need the different kind of perspectives, you need the partnerships, and I think public health will go further when people actually get stronger skills, uh, at least stronger understanding. And that should be part of the multidisciplinarity of public health. Yeah, this, this then of course means we still have a dream that one day the disciplines will come together as one. Great, <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, I have to apologize for uh, 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 Chris, Chris, I, I overlooked your comment on the chat. Please, Chris, why don't you share it with us directly? Ah, well, I was struck by, particularly struck by the phrase people in the bureaucracy, because how do you, and the last question we also had, how do we get expertise? How do scientists get expertise in policy? How do people in policy learn about science? The latter we've depended upon in a kind of an ad hoc fashion by every now and then a physicist or a physician gets elected in the United States to Congress. Yay, this is a wonderful thing, but there's no, it's just, it's stochastic how that happens. Um, with respect to the former, there's a formal program, it's overseen by the, by the American Association for the Advancement of Science in the United States that puts 100 or so new fellows every year on congressional staffs and in executive offices and now even in the, the judicial branch of the, of the government to give, specifically give scientists, to teach them about and give them expertise in how policy is made. And then about a third of those folks stay on in one fashion or another um, doing policy, um, doing science policy. I don't perceive there's anything like that in Switzerland. I think Switzerland suffers for having for not having something like that. Um, that to me is where it begins, is, is having formal ways by which people can learn and um, channels by which information can, information can flow in both directions. That's it. Yeah, and, and I think that having those sort of fellowships is really good. But I think the other way it can also work is to figure out whether um, people who work in government can actually do a sabbatical at a university. You know, take the time and learn about that research environment or maybe staff exchange um, so that you've got a regular system where university people can do a stint for a period or a project in the bureaucracy and people in the bureaucracy can do a project at a university. Um, I think that may be also another way of just increasing the opportunity for interchange and dialogue. This idea, Vivian, has come up earlier in, in one of the talks, I think when uh, Thomas Zentner was presenting, also in the discussion later, uh, we are still in this meeting here, 20 people. I wonder if there's anybody out there who has practical experience with this type of exchange programs 
uh, be it a practicum or a sabbatical, as Vivian just mentioned, uh, is there anybody out there who has uh, can share some experience? Did it work in your case or in your country, in your university or uh, uh, administration? I think it works on a, as Chris said, on a stochastic way. <laughs> or in a stochastic manner. I'm an example of that, but in a long-term sense. I was 10 years a bureaucrat before joining university, but I never went back. And, you know, Matja Seki, the former director, I think even 15 years to 10 years ago, when Zeltner was still the director of the Federal Office of Public Health, we tried to talk to them to have these sort of somewhat formalized exchange of positions for a half year or a year. And just to tell you the truth, it failed due to bureaucratic reasons of employment status. And we are very quickly back, who is paying the salary? Who is the real employer? How do you get a badge to go into the building if the other one is paying the salary? So it's, it never happened. The idea was around quite a long time and, uh, and I've seen also when I studied in the US uh, at some of even the prestigious Ivy League universities, you have professors that were in, you know, NIH, National Cancer Institutes, then they, they were at the, some university a few years later, they were back in some government agency. So this going back and forth, I haven't seen that in in Swiss academia so much actually happening. People in academia going up the ranks, they have mostly lived their whole life in academia. They haven't seen anything else. Being Not also optimistic here about Switzerland, but I agree that it would be much better if there is much more moving back and forth. But the incentive schemes are a bit different, so different that I think it's really difficult to have that happen. I think we've seen some movement in Australia on the initially on the clinical practice side in health services research with the NHMRC, which is the medical national health and medical research funding body, providing half-time fellowships so that a clinician can reduce their level of clinical work and then spend half time. Uh, with a university health services research group. So, I mean, that may be more easily brought together than the policy world, but one could imagine potentially some sort of, a, you know, half-time fellowship scheme. The other thing that, that has happened in, in Australia is actually the university has been quite keen to just give adjunct appointments to the policy, senior policy people in particular, to bring them into teaching. And by doing so, those senior people become more familiar with the universities. And of course, the benefit of the university is they might more quickly, easily get a research contract out of it. Um, but that seems to have been a bit of a win-win. Thomas, if, if I can add uh, something, because uh, this is exactly what we are trying to do with my research team in, uh, in Italy. It's time to involve, I think exchange is uh, the key word as I've written, and uh, uh, also based on my personal experience, uh, if we, we open first the university, it's easier uh, than to have this kind of exchange. So to invite uh, uh, decision makers, politicians, uh, and also those that are half politician and half uh, see themselves as a, a technical politician because they, as a second line of the politician, they are still politician, but uh, they are mainly decision makers. If we invite them regularly, uh, because of teaching, but, but also because of, of uh, seminars that are not too academic. That's another, I think, interesting issue because uh, uh, sometime uh, we in the past invited uh, these kind of person uh, for seminars that were very academic. 
and uh, uh, more theoretical and less practical. And uh, perhaps they came just for the first 10 minutes. Instead, if we involve them also in uh, a more practical uh, issues uh, and, uh, and also in a different way, not the classical seminar, workshop that are more horizontal and less vertical, well, in this way, they start to uh, have a different view of the university and, uh, and, uh, and they start to see the university nearer to uh, what they are doing. And uh, perhaps they sometimes could also think, well, why don't we ask some people at the university about this issue? Um, yeah, I think this is, uh, uh, this is uh, something that um, we as the organizers of this little meeting uh, will really take uh, seriously as a suggestion that, that comes now stronger and stronger. Uh, perhaps we can really work to a more open uh, exchange uh, of ideas. And Timothy is mentioning in his chat that you all saw humility so openness, respect uh, for the different paradigms and for the different uh, word, uh, ways to see things and to look for solutions. I think this is great. And uh, this is what we are going to take away as one of the many uh, lessons learned. So um, I think we used the time very well. Uh, it's, uh, it's getting late in uh, Hong Kong. I know um, it's time for a late dinner, I guess, Vivian. Um, for us in, over here in Switzerland or in, uh, Middle Europe, we can still see a little bit of sunshine, perhaps go for a walk, all these healthy things we should do. I would like to thank all of you uh, for this very nice afternoon talk, evening uh, meeting. Vivian, thanks, special thanks to you really great, such a complex issue, the way you introduced us to this and made us talk and discuss was wonderful. Thank you very much and thanks all for joining and join us next time. We look forward to seeing you again. So bye-bye, thank you around thank you. the world. Tschüss.